Welcome to Mrs. True Crime. Today's video is an in-depth look into cannibals and murderers Christopher Lee McEwen and Joseph Arbor Hansley. It's a tale of rage and hunger. If you are triggered by anything dealing with death and or brutality, feel free to click off this video. Perhaps check out my gaming channel, Retelly Games, for some lighthearted content. If not, I'm Nicole. Let's get started. Picture your favorite meal. That spaghetti that you sprinkle a secret ingredient in, or that macaroni and cheese that grandma makes just the way you like it. Can you smell it? it smells like happiness, right? Now picture that meal with ground up remains inside of it. Human remains. Does it still taste the same? As far back as 100,000 years, French paleontologists have found that Neanderthals participated in cannibalism, and in modern society, the method is still alive. From Agahori monks of Gangs River, India, to spur cases in Florida, cannibalism has expanded beyond movies and books. Some willingly allow themselves to be consumed, such as the tale of Bird Brands, who met with German computer expert Armin Mewis and had his penis cut off and consumed by both men. Brands was later murdered the following day by mules. He chopped his body and consumed him over the course of a few weeks. Others, however, such as 21-year-old Jana Shearer and 46-year-old Tammy Blayton, didn't ask nor wanted to have their lives ripped away from them and then consumed for pleasure. For only a few months in Tyler, Texas, Jana Shearer was dating 25-year-old Christopher Lee McEwen, who was separated from his estranged wife. Their relationship was anything but simple. As neighbor Freddie Costello told reporters that the two would argue constantly and loudly in their home and in their yard. McEwen's disagreements with Shearer would grow in intensity, as he was known for having a history of violence with not only Jana, but with his wife and sister. Along with his rage, his criminal records include DUIs and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. While there are many things unclear about why McEwen and his wife were estranged, whether it was because of his rage or another issue altogether, what was clear was his instability. Two weeks prior to the night of January 6, 2008, McEwen assaulted his wife. The following week of that assault, Mrs. McEwen went to the police and began an investigation on Christopher. The police stated she didn't require medical attention, but it was clear an assault had taken place. Over the course of the week, Christopher's anger would grow and his violence would intensify. That Friday night, Christopher drove to Jana Shearer's home and convinced her to get into his truck. Her mother witnessed her getting into his truck, leaving behind her shoes, purse, and phone. It's possible that Jana thought she'd return. Unfortunately, that would not be the case. At some point in the night, Christopher beat Jana over the head with a blunt object, killing her. He then drove to his wife's home around 3 a.m. armed with a knife. The police are uncertain what Christopher planned to do exactly when he broke into Mrs. McEwen's home, but managed to stab 42-year-old William Vesley, his wife's boyfriend. Vesley would survive the attack. The police would soon arrive, and McEwen gave chase and disappeared into the night. The next morning, he returned to his home that he shared with his mother and had stationed himself in his garage. He then called his mother into the garage, like a small child who made art with macaroni, to show her what he had done. There, Jana's corpse rests in the back of his pickup truck. Upon seeing the body, McEwen's mother and boyfriend fled the home to flag down an officer. In their absence, McEwen cut out pieces of Jana's flesh, as well as an ear, and went into the kitchen. From there, he called 911 himself, stating he'd killed Jana and was born in her parts. Immediately, the police acted and arrived at the home. McEwen refused to come out at first, barricading himself in the home for a short period. Eventually, he emerged and the police took action, looking into the scene before them. Jana's ear was found boiling in a pot on the stove, 
and a hunk of flesh was impaled on a fork on a plate on the kitchen table. While the scene looked like a shot from a cannibal slasher flick, the truth was that the police had and still have no way of knowing whether or not McEwen actually ate Jaina or if it was all for show. While on trial, McEwen stated that God made him kill Jaina, which may have been a way of him to get an insanity plea, but that fell through. Amy Gage, a friend of Jaina, stated, You can't sleep. You can't think straight anymore. Then you just keep finding out more and more. It's the most difficult thing anyone can go through. Christopher Lee McEwen died 11 months later in December 2008 at East Texas Medical Center after being found unresponsive in his cell. His cause of death was natural causes. In Jeffersonville, Indiana, Tammy Blayton had fallen head over heels for 33-year-old Joseph Abrahamson. She saw in him a man in need of a second chance and obliged to give it to him. Oberhansley was a convicted felon, serving 14 years for the 1998 killing of his 17-year-old girlfriend. Around that same time, he shot his mother and tried to kill himself. He was released in 2012, thought to be a changed man, but crime is a hard habit to break. In early 2014, Oberhansley was once again arrested on allegations of strangulation. When his bond was lowered, Tammy bailed him out. She was a happy person, and she tried to help this fool, and uh, this is what happened. Did you ever help Yeah, I did. I knew there was something wrong with him, but I couldn't pinpoint it. But we was just getting close again, and uh, I didn't want to say nothing. She was 47 years old. She'll always be my little girl, but she was grown. You know, what could you say? You know? After a while of dating, Tammy had had enough of Joseph. In early September 2014, Joseph and Tammy had gotten into one of their many fights around 9 p.m. At 9.30, witnesses saw Joseph placing his clothes into his car and leaving. Hours later, at around 2.50 a.m., Joseph returned banging on the door and crying. Tammy phoned police, saying that she was breaking up with him and had changed the locks and wanted him off the property. The police arrived around 3 a.m. and told him to leave, which she complied. At 3.30 a.m., Joseph arrived to his mother's home, distraught. They spoke outside for a while until his mother left him in his car to go back inside, leaving him with his thoughts. It is unclear where he went following this. Around 9 a.m. the following day, police were called to Tammy's home for a welfare check as she hadn't showed up to work and her co-workers had grown to worry. A co-worker said that she called Tammy's phone only for a man to answer, claiming to be her brother. The co-worker felt uneasy about the ordeal, not certain that the man was Tammy's brother. When the police arrived around 10 a.m., they noticed signs of forced entry. On alert, they knocked on the door and was greeted by Joseph, calling himself Joe, but didn't have any identification on him. The police began to ask him questions about himself and Tammy's whereabouts, but Oberhansley was slow and vague in responding. An officer then took note of a fresh injury on his hand. The officers then asked for Oberhansley to put his hands up and face the wall to be patted down. But instead, he backed away and began to reach into his back pocket. Not wanting to see what his next move would be, officers physically took control of Oberhansley and reached in his back pocket to discover a pocket knife with the blade extended covered in blood and hair. But whose blood and hair was on the knife? Oberhansley did have a fresh wound on his hand after all. Soon, the question would get answered as the police ventured throughout the home, finding droplets of blood as if clues to a treasure hunt, but at the end wasn't treasure at all. Following the trail to a large portion of blood leading to the bathroom, police found a tarp over the tub. Lifting the tarp, they uncovered the mutilated body of Tammy Blayton. The coroner reported that a large portion of Tammy's brain and heart were missing as well as parts of her lung. Initially, Oberhansley denied any wrongdoing, but eventually confessed to breaking into Tammy's home and stabbing her to death, then using a jigsaw to cut open her skull and any parts of her heart, brain, and lung. He was charged with murder, abuse of a corpse, and breaking and entering. The case, though missing a few bits of story, seemed to be an easy conviction, but alas, these things never are. 
Once court began its proceedings, Oberhansley changed his story. He began to claim his innocence and that the police arrested the wrong man, going so far as to say that he wasn't Joseph Oberhansley at all, but former NFL player Zeus Brown. Orlando Zeus Brown was an NFL player for the Ravens and Browns who died in 2011 at the age of 40. Whether Oberhansley believed he's Zeus Brown is up for speculation, but the police aren't convinced. They believe it's all a ruse and that Oberhansley knows who he is and what he did. Along with his charges, in 2015, Oberhansley was also charged with the rape of Tammy Blanton. The rape kit showed that Tammy was raped prior to her death. Prosecutors have been trying to get the death penalty for Oberhansley because of the brutality of the crime, but so far their efforts have failed. As of October 2017, Oberhansley was found not fit to stand trial. The court has been filing paperwork to get him admitted to a state facility. Once there, he is to be treated in order to be restored to stand trial. After three months, if he is still found unfit, he would continue his stay at the facility until found fit or otherwise. 21-year-old Jana Shearer and 46-year-old Tammy Blayton were laid to rest in their respective towns following their heinous murders. Both women were known to friends and family as bright, happy, and caring. Neither woman, nor anyone for that matter, deserves the torment of being slaughtered by the person you love. Hopefully, both women are at peace. I'm Mrs. True Crime, and remember to be kind, be loud, be aware. For more information about either of these crimes, why not check out some of these awesome links? And if you like what you saw and heard today, why not drop a like and a comment? Maybe subscribe while you're here? <laughs> I make new videos every Tuesday and Friday, and you don't want to miss what's in store.